2010, Steve Jobs unveiled the first phone with flat edges. He called it the most beautiful thing Apple had ever made and compared it to a Leica camera. This is beyond a doubt the most precise thing, one of the most beautiful things we've ever made. Its closest kin is like a beautiful old Leica camera. This was a turning point for the industry, the transformation of gadgets into premium accessories. 15 years later, literally every flagship has become this. What worked perfectly in 2010 with the light and compact iPhone 4 now digs into your palm, prevents a comfortable grip, and is even causing an epidemic of smartphone pinky. It seems like the marketers simply defeated the designers, that ergonomics were sacrificed just so the phone would look premium on a shelf. That is the convenient answer, but it is the wrong one. These sharp edges represent millions of dollars in savings, not just for Apple, but for the entire industry. And from an engineering standpoint, doing it any other way now is simply impossible. But why, after the iPhone 5, did we live with rounded edges for six years? Why exactly are flat edges the signifier of premium and how are Sony and Braun connected to this? How do you like this design? It is an iPhone with a Sony logo. This document surfaced in 2012 during the Apple versus Samsung trial. Jobs had already said before this that Sony laptops were the only ones on which he would be willing to run Macintosh OS. And Apple was inspired by their devices in both design and engineering solutions. And this is the Braun T3 radio from 1958, which inspired absolutely everyone elevating it to the status of an absolute design cult. You will understand in a moment why I say this with a certain skepticism. Because Dieter Rams, the designer of the T3 radio, largely inherited the ideology of the Bauhaus. The design school that produced minimalist and functional items in the early 20s in Germany and truly predetermined many modern design tendencies. And they also created the greatest bait and switch in the history of design, which Apple took advantage of, but we will get to that. The initial idea was utilitarianism, to reject unnecessary ornamentation, to dedicate form to content, to focus on usability, and of course on mass production, so it would be accessible to everyone. A manifesto that changes not just the style, but the quality of life for the whole world in theory. $2,000 adjusted for today's average purchasing power was the cost of the T3 radio in 1958. There was no talk of accessibility whatsoever. It was an image-driven, premium, expensive product. Image and premium aesthetic are also about my website, which I built entirely using the service Ready AI, the sponsor of this video, and my website. The ad brief did not ask for a personal recommendation, but this is my honest opinion. I can confidently recommend this tool even to professional designers. Moreover, I want to be honest and direct, I had some skepticism. Because I'm used to working directly with LLMs like Gemini or Claw, syncing with my GitHub and hosting straight to Versal. It sounds complex, which is why it seemed to me that such a stack gave me maximum flexibility and power. But I changed my mind, and now when I need a website for some of my products, I go to Ready AI. It took me about 20 minutes on the site to get the first good result, and then I spent about 40 minutes polishing it to perfection. What is important is that the system does not lose context during long interactions, does not ruin what is already done well. And overall, the prompt understanding and execution accuracy feel better to me than working directly with an LLM, even with ones as good at code as Gemini 1.5 or Claude Opus 3.5. I did not ask the guys exactly what they have under the hood, which LLM, because specs do not matter as much when everything works. If it is one of the big three, it is clearly heavily fine-tuned specifically for these tasks. In short, I am very impressed. It is a serious professional tool with which you can really quickly assemble a high-quality website. New users can now create two projects for free. I highly recommend trying it. Returning to our topic, remember I mentioned the lack of ecology in systems of motivation, attention, and decision-making, which at the same time try to maintain this legend of practicality. In fairness, the Bauhaus arrived at this too. When popularity hit public attention and recognition followed, designers and their influence were acknowledged and they wanted to make increasingly interesting things within the created style. As a result, design schools still teach the history of Bauhaus as a practical functional approach to design. Just like the works of Dieter Rams, overlooking the fact that the initial manifesto had little in common with the most legendary and key products of the era where minimalism was born. Apple, known for glass, metal, and strict forms, was not like this at all before 2010. 
the old IMAX and iBooks were bright plastic almost toy-like, which was very much in the spirit of the times. Here I want to introduce a term for explanation, which we will use as a lens to understand this entire story and tie all the threads together. This term is the governing constraint. And we will walk through the four governing constraints that determined why all phones look exactly the way they do. Until 2010, the governing constraint was considered the fear of technology because the entire population of the Earth was adopting it at tremendous speed and it was important to make it all appear human, friendly, fun and simple to master. But by 2010 the market had matured significantly and the average level of computer literacy had increased by orders of magnitude over 10 years. Accordingly, the market grew by orders of magnitude. The fair constraint almost vanished. Instead, a new constraint arose for Apple, commoditization. People got used to gadgets, phones and laptops risked turning into utilitarian plastic trash like toasters or TV remotes, to sell devices with high margins Apple needed to overcome the perception of tech as a simple tool. Before this, Sony managed to pull off this trick with their incredibly expensive Vio laptops, Braun with their T3 radio and Leica with cameras. All of them relied on creating a white myth around themselves, just as their progenitor, the Bauhaus, once did. The iPhone 4 is a design that absorbed these stories, but with one difference. Look at this graph. These are the sales of everything I listed, and these are the sales of the iPhone 4. Just the iPhone 4, not counting all subsequent models. Sales grew, which meant mobile traffic grew, and reading or watching videos is more comfortable on a large screen. The market was changing, and Apple began to feel the pressure of the weight they themselves created. But the governing constraint changed too. The iPhone became both the standard and a premium device simultaneously. That was no longer the constraint. What was the constraint now was maintaining usability quality while increasing the diagonal. It was vital not to lose the signature attention to comfort details. That is why phones became rounded, even though they did not depart from the premium style. But now, despite the greater weight and size, they did not cut into the palm and were comfortable for the growing number of gestures used to control the system. This decision provided a safety margin for several years, which we will now skip over to face a new fundamental constraint. The trend towards multi-camera systems ate up space. 5G modems heated up and required heat dissipation, which also took up space just like the new powerful processors. And all of this consumed more energy while eating away at precious battery space. This is exactly what makes the problem of component density inside the chassis much more significant over these few years than ever before. And if we recall the previous three governance constraints, they were external. But now we have engineering necessities that directly contradict user comfort. And this is a major paradigm shift. Do you think this is a sign that things are bad at Apple? Let us look at other examples. Status cars right up until the 90s evolved and changed. They stole ideas from each other. They overcame external governing constraints forming the design of new generations. But since the mid-90s the constraints changed and everyone had to deal with aerodynamics. The point of no return was the 1996 Ford Taurus. There were many aerodynamic experiments before it, but when the mass market car in the US launched with that design, it turned the market definitively. The Ford Taurus is the direct analog of the iPhone 12, and aerodynamics is the direct analog of density and heat dissipation in enclosures. For 30 years, cars have been changing slightly within very limited stylistic frameworks. We will talk about the Cybertruck design another time. The second analogy is skyscraper architecture, phase one aesthetics. Even technical restrictions on pointed tops to avoid shading the street were turned into a space for aesthetics. The Woolworth building in 1913 and the Chrysler building in 1930 are the main illustrations of this phase. But later, with the growth of height seismic and wind resistance, turned into the governing constraint. And since then, height is the main determining factor of how a building will look. High-rise architecture has been defined by external constraints for almost 70 years. The problem is not Apple, it is that the market has reached its technical ceiling which has unified its appearance for many years. And this has happened to the entire market. Manufacturers aren't just copying the iPhone chassis design, they are all operating under the same governing constraint dictated by the market density. We are left with changing materials, although judging by the vapor chamber in the iPhone 17 Pro, everyone might soon have to switch to aluminum. And the appearance of the back panel, the camera block and button placement. 
not that much room to maneuver. Or wait for the next technological breakthrough that will help redefine the governing constraint. But it will remain external and phones will remain identical. Some situations just need to be let go. And for all of Apple's design centricity history shows, that letting go is exactly where Apple has problems. It is in the Cupertino headquarters that the most innovations are born, but they also drag the largest amount of artifacts from the past with them. But the most interesting part is their attempts at innovation where there is no place for it. A vivid example is the years of failed MacBook Pros and useless Mac Pros and behind this lies not a design error but the side effect of the inability to let go. Which relies on Apple's culture created by one man and it is not Steve Jobs but Johnny Ive, the most influential person in the history of design. Watch how his decisions almost destroyed Apple's design monopoly. And do not forget about Ready AI. New users can now create two projects for free. I highly recommend trying it. Bye.